For Crema Media's engineering news, I'm Mamaili Mamaila. Joining me today is retired ESCOM Chief Nuclear Officer David Nichols to discuss ESCOM. Welcome, David. Thank you. So, can ESCOM's challenges be mitigated? Well, I think they have to be. Um, quite simply, if we don't have a power utility in the country, then we haven't got an economy. Um, so, yes, they can. Mm -hmm. There the, are, the, I think, three major crises that ESCOM's facing at the moment. Um, one is the physical plant performance at the moment. Plant availability is, is poor and getting worse from the look of all the results. Second one is a longer term one of what replaces the current coal fleet as it starts wearing out. They're already decommissioning older pl coal plants. Mm. And by about 2028, ESCOM will have decommissioned as much plant as they brought on with Madupi and Kasili. So they need to actually bring something else on by the late 2020s, mm. be it refurbishment of the current stations in a major way. And lastly, clear is the financial one. Um, the first one of those uh, has to be addressed by aggressive management and leadership, and there's a problem in the company, I suggest, at the moment, because their morale, I would think, is not very good, given they're being told they're bloated over staff and are all going to get retrenched. doesn't do much for morale, and morale is fundamental in making companies run well. But the other one simply is having the funds available to do the work. It's notable that between about 2016 and 2016-17, uh, money was released to make sure that there actually was adequate money to do the maintenance. And as has been mentioned, that, 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 that constraint became too extreme and they had to close down, reduce the maintenance activities because there was no money. Mm. So people were getting approval to, do, approval to spend the money for a major overhaul weeks before the overhaul started. Mm. And as spare, par spare parts may take 18 months to order, it's a lot difficult to do an overhaul when the spare parts are 18 months away. Mm. Um, and so that that's to get the money released to the system. Um, and then again is the financial situation. ESCOM is in fact still one of the lowest cost producers in the world. If you look at the actual graphs of where ESCOM stands, it historically was, it was almost absurdly cheap. It was like half the price of the next cheapest person in the world ten years ago. Um, because ESCOM was doing no build, because all he was doing was paying for operating maintenance and fuel mm. and covering its costs in that. <laughs> and that's the financial crisis that comes into, which unfortunately is only yet covered by having higher tariffs. Mm. Uh, you can see at the moment the government's putting in the, this money every, every year, um, which is really a way, I think, of subsidizing ESCOM to avoid the tariff increase being too great. Um, it's also notable that the amount of money being paid in by the state into ESCOM now is a little bit, it's about this, it's a bit less than is currently being paid to, to the IPPs every year. Mm. So it's almost the state is almost paying for the IPPs as part of the process. So what is the utility death spiral? Ah, a well-known buzz phrase, yeah. which be like, originally utilities had a function, I'll go back to the 20s and 30s when they were created, which said you have to have universal access so everyone can get connected to the grid, that should be universally common prices across the system, and, but you got a monopoly for doing that, be that a state or a private one. What everyone forgets about is that there is an awful lot of effort and work and money going into being available to meet the demand when it comes. And what's happened over the last 10, 15 years is people have increasingly brought in, normally under instruction or subsidy or some other uh, diktat putting them in, other alternative suppliers. What that's done is it's meant that the difficulty of managing the grids got worse because the instability has got worse because the supply and the new supplier certainly renewables tend to be much more, in, more intermittent um, but they have so they've left the obligation to supply on the old utility but they've taken away a large amount of its income because you've now got people competing for just the energy portion of their job um, and made their job more difficult so essentially they've ended up going quite severely um, financially constrained. And you can see this in, in countries where, and a good example say is Germany, where they've put a lot of renewables in. And what's happened is that the wholesale price on the grid has gone down because there's so much extra power being put into the grid by the renewables on occasion. So the prices are being forced down. But the domestic, the actual retail price has gone up quite significantly. And the gap in the middle has gone from being a small portion of the overall grid costs to a very large fraction where the state is cross-subsidizing to keep the IPPs in business um, and the renewables working. And so that's sort of the problem you're into. So as that goes on, as long as you 
leave somebody with an obligation to supply which they can't avoid, and you don't give them the income, because you take the income away to other, you know, the cash stream goes to other suppliers, they essentially end up going bankrupt. Um, and then you've got a political desire which says, you must not shut down. Clearly, if, if, if the power utility was a maker of old-fashioned telephones, and there was no demand for telephones, they would just close down and go away, and no one would miss them, mm. the new suppliers. But the answer is that in the utility business, you always need that supplier of last resort. And that payment is not being made. I, I always quote the example. The, the, the average price of a kilowatt hour, I'm guessing now, is in the order of, say, two rand a kilowatt hour. It's the current tap with the new tariffs. Of that, only about 30 cents is energy. 30 cents of that is buying coal. The rest is buying the power station, buying the infrastructure, maintaining everything, being ready to supply the need when you turn the switch on. And the independent power producers are, co are competing with that th that they're, that they're claim they're competing with the two rand or the one rand as a, as a wholesale price, but in fact they're actually com they're only removing the cost of 30 cents. Mm -hmm. So that drives you there, and, and it's happening elsewhere in the world, and the countries that have gone, in this country, it started in the mid-1990s when ESCOM was told, don't build more power stations, somebody else will do so. So ESCOM started at that point to run its cost structure down to avoid new build, hence the price fell so low. But again, finally, it was told, you must build Madupi and Kassili. It's an interesting thought process that says that ESCOM was not set up to build Madupi and Kassili. It never planned to. For 10 years, it had said, we're not going to build things. We've been told it's not our job. Somebody else will build the next power station. So, and it's an example of the problem you have. And then ESCOM has been bankrupted because the tariff has never really reflected the cost of building power stations. Mm. And what is your outlook for the future of ESCOM? Uh, I think that's an interesting question. What would I like it to be? What? At the moment, the outlook would appear to be they're going to try and restructure into three companies, mm -hmm. or four companies, a holding company and three subsidiaries. My personal view is that's more difficult than it's meant out to be, because I think that the, that the contracts between, certainly between transmission and generation will get very complicated, and it won't be in one organization. It'll actually be in two different legal entities. So. Transmission will have to provide guarantees to generation for the, uh, for the PPAs that generation will ask them to sign. So there'll be a whole question, I think there'll be a whole lot of complicated questions coming out of that. Mm. Um, but essentially, I, I, I worry that unless we have a vision and a realization that maybe some of the ideas coming around about the, the, the new way of doing power generation haven't really worked out anywhere in the world. Mm. And as such, as long as we go driving down this route, we may end up in a similar place to, to say, Germany, which is technically high ahead of us, but has power prices at about three times ours. I'm not sure we'll end up going there. Mm. That's where the present thing tour takes us. Mm. Thank you, David. Thank you. That was retired ESCOM Chief Nuclear Officer David Nichols discussing ESCOM with Engineering News.